Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching Creating Pools. So in this lesson, we're going to go over the different types of pools that you create when deploying UCS. And pools are going to be a very important concept as we continue on into service profiles. So we'll start off with what are pools, and then kind of give you a quick run of the types of pools. After that, we're going to go through each one of them individually. And don't worry about the acronyms. We'll define those as we go through them. But we'll start with Management IP Address Pool, UUID Pools, the MAC Address Pools, WWNN and WWPN Pools, Server Pools, and then finally Server Pool Membership. There's going to be a lot of jumping back and forth in and out of labs in this lesson. So it's going to be very quick. We'll describe a pool, then we're going to jump over to lab, show you how to create it, give you some recommendations for naming schemes and functionality. So hopefully you can get some extra benefit out of the pools, and then back to the slide deck to continue on. So with that, let's get started. So what are pools? Well, simply, Cisco UCS uses a concept of service profiles. And we've kind of briefly touched on these in some of the lessons. It's kind of hard to talk about UCS without talking about service profiles. So a service profile takes everything that makes a server a server and kind of puts it in this logical encapsulation. So what I mean by that confusing de definition is if you're a VMware or a, a virtualization person, you understand how we take a guest OS and we wrap this fake hardware abstraction layer around it. And that way we can pick it up and we can move it and we can do all sorts of cool things with it because we're not tying anything to physical hardware. Think of service profiles like that. So you've got a base blade with CPUs and memory and mezzanine adapters and firmware and drivers and MAC addresses and all this stuff. And what we do is using service profiles, we abstract that. So MAC address is a great example. We could use the MAC address on the mezzanine cards. Each I.O. port is going to have at least a MAC address with it. But we don't do that. Why? Because what happens if I want to move that operating system or that installed OS from one blade to another? Everything would change. So we encapsulate into service profiles and we create this logical pool of MAC addresses. And when a service profile is created, that OS that gets installed on the blade sees the MAC addresses we assign, not the ones on hardware. So it allows us to move those around as we want to. Then we can be very flexible in configuration. We can change things, move things very dynamically without being tied to a piece of hardware. It is a very UCS way to do business. So often uh, some use cases just real quick for things like service profiles are you may run Oracle on Red Hat Linux and you may decide one day to upgrade the RAM in that blade. Well, you can do that one of two ways. A lot of people I deal with will have a spare blade in the UCS environment. So there will be another blade in a chassis somewhere that is kind of the standby blade. If one of the primary blades fails, they will disassociate service profile from the failed blade, associate it to the backup or spare blade, and boot the OS up. They also use it for things like I just said, maybe you have Oracle running on Red Hat and you want to put more memory in that blade. Well, what they'll do is they'll put memory in the spare blade and do that process. Shut down the original blade, disassociate service profile, and reassociate to the spare with more memory, and the old blade now becomes the spare. We couldn't do that if we tied things to physical hardware. So that's why we create these, these kind of abstracted addresses for things like MAC addresses and worldwide names for Fiber Channel and all sorts of other things. And that's what we're going to talk about now. There's also the concept of resource pools, resource pools for server deployment. It automates provisioning and makes it easy for selecting a blade kind of based on criteria. And we'll show that you can have a pool that says, hey, this pool contains blades with two CPUs and at least 32 gigs of RAM and two internal hard drives. And when you deploy a service profile, you can just say, go grab one that meets this criteria or go grab one out of that pool that meets this criteria. It just makes allocating and provisioning blades easier. So we're going to talk about a couple types of pools. First is a management IP address, then UUID, MAC address, WWNN, WWPN, server pools, and really server pool membership isn't a pool, but it talks about how we assign blades to the pools. The key to most of these is standardization. So we're going to define these and go through them. And I, on most of them, I give you kind of some ideas for how you may want to structure the naming scheme. But create a standard and stick with it. Make it meaningful. Make it extensible. Meaning don't put yourself in a corner where you're going to have to redo this naming structure because you never thought you would need more than 128 MAC addresses. And now with VMware 
and multiple adapters and these virtual interface cards like the Paolo or the VIC-1280, you're blowing through that number. So kind of keep that in mind as you deploy these. So the first one is a management IP address pool. It's a pool of IP addresses that are used to access a server via the CIMC, Cisco Integrated Management Controller. Think of it as the onboard management, kind of lights out management functionality. It's used for KVM access, uh, serial over LAN, and IPMI management. So there's a couple of ways to do these. You can set them statically, assigned to a server, meaning pretty much a blade, assigned to a service profile, or using a pool, which is the most common method. Now, when you use a KVM, you're going to enter an IP address, or it's going to connect via an IP address, and you're going to connect to the IP that is grabbed from a pool. So, a couple things to think about here. First of all, these connect through the management zero interfaces on the fabric interconnects. So, what happens is, remember that the FIs are active-active for data. So, if you have 20 blades, it's probably going to be somewhere around 10 on one and 10 on the other. You can test this because if you go pull the cable out of one of the management zero interfaces, half of your KVM IPs, your blades, will no longer be reachable for KVM access. I actually ran into that at a site one day. They just could not get access to some of their KVMs. It turned out to be a bad connector on a cable, and it was making it so that management zero wasn't coming up. There are some things about that. If you remember back when we set the management zero interface IP, there was nowhere to set a VLAN. There was nowhere to set really much other than an IP gateway and subnet mask. So the thing is, is that you can't set that on the management IPs either. So they're going to have to be on the same IP range as management zero in the same VLAN. So what we see a lot of people do is they'll put management zero interfaces on fabric interconnects into some sort of management network, along with other management zero interfaces on other Cisco equipment. Well, then all of a sudden you've got these KVM IPs. And so you got to make sure there's enough of them available, and you may have some issues with getting secure access to that network. So it's something to keep in mind. I see it as kind of a gap in UCS Manager right now. I'm hoping, even in 2.0 they haven't resolved this, I'm hoping we'll see you'll be able to select maybe tagged VLANs or something like that and be able to connect to them like that. But right now, you can't. You set an IP range, and they just go in and out of the Management Zero interface. That's it. No tagging, nothing like that for VLANs. So let's go ahead and jump to the lab real quick and do this. So we're going to do two things. We're going to create a management IP pool. And then if you wanted to statically assign an IP to a server or service profile, I'll quickly show you how to do that. So we're going to be using the UCS platform emulator for this. It's a great way to see this. So let's go ahead and jump on over to that. So here we are in the UCS platform emulator. To create your management IP pool, we'll do this to the admin tab. Scroll down until you see management IP pool, IP pool external management. Unlike a lot of the other pools that we'll see, you can't create additional pools. External management is the only one you can have. So MAC address pools, you can make five of them and tell service profile to pull one out of those five. With these, that's not the case. So a couple of tabs at the top, IP addresses, IP blocks and events, and I'll show you these here in just a second. First, let's create a block of IP addresses. So you're going to say, what is your range from? So I'll do 192, 168, 250, and you tell it the size. I'll do 20. Then you can change your subnet mask and your default gateway. You want to make sure and set those. So this will be from 50 to, I guess, 69. So we'll say OK and it's created. You can then create a second block of pools. So maybe you ran out of IPs on the first one, so we'll do another one. We'll make it size of 10 and the same default gateway. And say OK. So as we walk through the tabs that are now populated, you'll see a couple of things. First of all, this breaks down each individual IP address, 50 through 69, and then 100 through 109. You'll also see that it's already assigned two IPs to the two kind of blades that I've got configured in the UCS PE. One of them is up here. This is blade one chassis one, blade two chassis one. 
Also note that it doesn't hand them out sequentially. You would think that Blade 1 Chassis 1 is going to get dot 50 and the second one's going to get 51, and that's not the case. There's a formula for doing this. I suggest you just consider it random. So don't assume that your first blade is going to get your first IP. You will be sadly disappointed, and that's not going to happen. But if you want to see what gets assigned, this is the tab to do that. Also kind of note it shows previously assigned to in case it changes. So if you're like, man, what did that IP used to be? You'll be able to look this up. Blocks are simple. Which blocks do you have configured? And it'll show those for you real easily here. And I don't think events, no, there's no really any events, even though it assigned them to the blades. So that's how you do normal pools. And, and we just use pools and let the pool IP get assigned to a blade, a physical blade. But you've got another option. You can also assign an IP to a service profile and it just is kind of depends on how you want to do things. So to me, even though we usually do uh, blades, it can make sense with the concept of service profiles to do it that way. So with a service profile, you will assign a KVM IP or a management IP to that and if service profile moves from blade 1 to blade 8, that IP moves with it. So it just depends if you want to be able to KVM to blade 1 or KVM to say the exchange server. And if you want the exchange server to always have the KV, same KVM IP, then I would assign it to the service profile because that's going to be what moves the exchange server. So to do a service profile, we go to servers and then we pick service profiles and then our profile. For some odd reason, NPE, this one's named 11. On the right, there's an expansion box here for management IP address. By default, it is none. But you can also do static and pooled. And if we say pooled, I'll save changes. And let's try to save it again. There it goes. And let's see if it actually grabbed one. And the reason I say let's see is being the PE, occasionally weird things happen. So let's come in here. And I don't see where it has done that yet. And there's really no way to refresh this list. But it should go ahead. Oh, it says assigned three, so obviously it pulled one from somewhere. There it is. So that one assigned one to the service profile. And notice it also is still assigned to the physical blade. So now you've got one kind of in both places. Uh, it'll chew up more IPs, but you get the flexibility that comes with it. As I mentioned in the slide deck, you note when we created these blocks of IP addresses that there's nowhere to set a VLAN or anything like that. So you really need to have them on the same range of VLAN as your management zero interfaces. You could do some crazy things like having two IP address ranges on the same VLAN that's connected to management zero and kind of play some games, but most of the time it's on the same IP range. So that was easy enough. Let's jump back to the slide deck and we'll move on to the next type of pool. Now, UUID pool. So UUID stands for Universally Unique Identifier. It's basically, you can think of it like a serial number. Normally in a server, like a rack server or something else, it's embedded in the BIOS. And it's used for licensing and other forms of identification. The thought is that it is a unique number that specifies that computer right there and no other. But, knowing how we do service profiles, we're going to fix that. So it's represented by a 32-digit hex number. And so it's separated by five hyphens in a weird notation. It's 844412. And I give you an example there. Really big, long, funky number. And you create it in the servers tab. Servers, pools, UUID, suffix pools. So the prefix is set, and you should not change it as it's generated for that install of UCS using some formula or algorithm. The suffix is settable. So you can change the prefix. Don't change the prefix but do change the suffix. And really, I don't have a, a, any sort of a recommendation for a scheme here, simply because very, very few things actually use UUIDs. And anything that does, it's going to be specific to the server. So you're not going to see UUIDs floating around a network and need to trace them back to a blade. So it really doesn't matter how you do these. Here's a little bit of a pool format. The only thing that you might want to set, and again, it's not a big deal. There's no real suggested, but you can do like a domain ID. We'll use this in other pools, so it's kind of good to standardize a domain ID. 
to differentiate installations of UCS, but again, it's not a requirement. So let's jump back over to the UCS PE and take a look at configuring a UUID suffix pool. As I said, it's under servers. Scroll down here and UUID suffix pools. So there's usually a pool created called pool default. You can go back up a level and create a new pool and call it whatever you want here. This is actually the same screen as the one I was just on. You can leave default, you can create your own, it really doesn't matter. So let's go ahead and we'll just edit this one. So there's no suffixes already created, we'll go ahead and do that. So we'll create a block of UUID suffixes. Now, if you notice here to the right, this is the predefined prefix. And let's see, that's DD, it doesn't let me change it there, but I believe if I hit create, nope, it actually doesn't let you change it. In fact, I believe in 2.0, UCS Manager 2.0, it does let you change that. So there's a couple of things in 2.0 that you can't do in 1.3 and 1.4, and PE runs on 1.4 UCSM. So this is one of those things. There's also some changes, I believe, in the WWPN and NN settings and pools where you can change those. And I believe in the MAC address, there's some things you can change there. So they kind of protect you from yourself in 1.3, 1.4 but those go away in 2.0 because I know I've changed that in 2.0. So let's jump back and say create. So here you go. You create the suffix. You're more than welcome to start at one and just increment up and say I want 200 of these. Or you can do whatever. If you want to do a domain ID, you may say this is my first install of UCS, so domain is one. And you'll note the first digit in the, uh, the suffix is your domain ID up to nine different installs of UCS or if you want to get really you know forward-looking you could do 01 doesn't matter we'll use a domain ID sometimes in later pools so just pick this one and hit OK you can continue to create blocks just like we did in the management pool you can have multiple blocks if you run out of one but it's again it's kind of just however you want to do it so here is all the ones that we've created now none of them have been assigned why haven't they assigned these to blades? Very simply, blades already have UUIDs. They're in the hardware. These are for service profiles, so later we will deploy out of this pool, and then it will get assigned, so you won't see anything populate yet. Just like our IPs, you can see our blocks and any faults. Um, the original fault was that it was empty. Well, yeah, that's the default state. Now it's not, so that's already actually been acknowledged. We'll do that. There we go. And events, which there are none because nothing's really happened. So UUID is very simple. Just throw down some numbers. The only maybe recommendation for naming scheme is to throw a domain ID in front of it. So let's jump back to the slide deck and continue forward. Now for MAC address pools. So I've used this as an example several times before. MAC addresses are media access control addresses they are hard-coded addresses on a network adapter so if you have a four port adapter each one of those ports has a MAC address you've been able to override those in like operating systems but normally people just use the one hard-coded on the card and each virtual NIC that we create or service profile using physical NICs whatever is going to be assigned a unique MAC address so again you can use the hard-coded address on the mezzanine adapter or most very very highly recommended use a MAC pool. MAC addresses are 48-bit addresses. They're separated by colons like we see here, 0025B52C4DB2. 0025B5 is what's known as the organizationally unique identifier. That means anytime Cisco builds something with a MAC address, they put 0025B5 in front of it. Emulex, Intel, Broadcom, Realtek, all those guys have their own OUI. And then they assign the rest of the, of the MAC address and that way we can be assured that we don't overlap. It's just a way to make sure that MAC addresses are unique across the entire world. These are created, these pools are created in the LAN tab, LAN pools, MAC pools. And as of, four, of 141 you can assign the entire 48-bit address. So I think I said 2.0 a minute ago, so it looks like 141, which I know my UCSPE is not on the latest 1.4 build. They have not released that at the time I'm doing this. My suggestion, as I bold out there, is don't change it. If you start changing the OUI, 
you could. I mean, it's going to be rare. You're going to have to win the lottery kind of thing. But you could accidentally assign it as the same as another NIC somewhere on that network segment. So there's some flexibility given the last three kind of fields for how we do naming schemes. So there's really no reason to override the OUI. But some people do it. Just be very cautious when you do it. So here's a suggested MAC address pool format, and really it's up to you as to what you want to do with it. So you can denote all sorts of information like cluster number using like a domain ID, physical location, operating system, which is a common one. So we'll have a pool for VMware boxes that's different than a pool for Windows servers or Linux servers. That way, if I'm doing some network analysis and I pull a MAC address, I can go, oh, let's see, that is UCS cluster 1 in data center 2 and that's a Windows box and I'll know what it is just by looking at that. So I've got a suggestion here. So I've left the first three fields, the OUI alone, 0025B5. So for like GH, those two digits, you could do a domain ID. You can do IJ could be OS or fabric. So often we'll do MAC addresses that denote it's fabric A or fabric B and you'll know which port off the mezzanine adapter it is. And KL is a sequential sort of hex. Problem is, if you do that with just KL, each one of those is a hex digit. 16 times 16 is 128, or I'm sorry, 256, and you'll have an issue with that. So if you plan to have more than 256 network adapters, which could happen given the fact that I talked about how we can slice and dice up those uh, virtual interface cards, and a lot of times we'll say a VMware server, we may have 12 total, we could run into that issue. So you can get flexible. Also, the thing to remember is, is that you know each of those fields is a two-digit or two-character field. So you don't have to dedicate domain ID to the fourth field. It could be the first character in that field, and Fabric or OS could be the second character. So there's a lot of flexibility. Often we will do UCS cluster domain ID and operating system, and then leave the last for kind of a sequential set of hex numbers. So now let's jump back over to UCSPE and kind of go through creating a MAC address pool and we'll talk a little bit more about naming schemes. So as I said, we'll go to the LAN tab, pools, MAC pools, and there's a default. There's already one here as well that got created, I believe, during installation. Let's go ahead and do our own. So we'll add one and we'll do lab MAC next and then add MAC addresses so here we are 0025 B5 and my version does let me change it I couldn't remember if it did or not I've been in and out of labs and our 20 lab and our 14 lab and the PE sometimes it's hard to keep track so you can change these I just recommend you don't it even says here you're strongly encouraged to use the following MAC profile which is 0025 B5 so we can change the end and then we set a size. So we could say this is domain ID 1. And if we wanted this to be, you know, fabric A, we could do 1, 1 and 1, 2 for fabric B. So we'll say 1, 1. And if these are windows, we will say it's a 1. And then the last digits can be set for standard MAC addresses. So we'll say this is good for uh, 256. Or we'll even go more and say 384 because we've got space to do it. We'll say OK. So at the top here, we will hit or here we'll hit finish. And if we go and look at our pool and MAC addresses and the full MAC. So it's all the way down to there. So if you leave three digits, that's a lot of space. That is, let me do a quick calculation here, 16, 16, 16. That's 4,096 MAC addresses you'll be able to assign. That should pretty much cover about any UCS install you're going to do. So that way you get domain, you can do location, and you can do either fabric or OS. So very simple. And again, these are not going to show as an assignment because it's going to wait until it's assigned from service pool or service profile. My only other recommendation would be rename this to something better. Actually, that's one thing I don't think I've mentioned when talking about UCSM, is that you can't really rename things. That's hopefully coming in a future release, but right now, 
This is a good example. I threw out a generic name for my Mac pool. And now I'm thinking, you know, it would probably help to have it say, this is Mac pool for Fabric A Windows Server. So I'm going to go rename it. Oh, I can't. The only thing I can do is delete it and recreate it. So that's something to keep in mind as you're doing this. But again, just pick a good naming scheme, stick with it, and just use that for assignment. It's kind of tough to go back and change some of these things later. If you've got MAC addresses already out there, you don't want to be deleting the pool that they were derived from, or you're going to cause yourself to have some real problems as it pushes those changes out to service profiles. So that's it for this lab. We'll jump back over to the slide deck. So now we're on to the pools that you use for fiber channel networking. So if you're not going to use fiber channel, you really don't have to worry about setting these, but for, for probably, I don't know, 90, 95% of the UCS implementations we do, they're using fiber channel. So this is pretty much a standard option for a lot of the deployments we do. So we'll start with WWNN pools. WWNN or worldwide node names, as we talked about in the storage lesson, are a unique address for a fiber channel node. So you may have a blade that has a mezzanine card with two ports, each of those is an HBA, and the blade will have one worldwide node name. Even a full width blade with two mezzanine cards will have a single worldwide node name. So it's a unique address for a fiber channel node. It's formatted as a 64-bit address separated by colons. And I've got an example here of basically 200A on and on and on. Similar to MAC addresses, the 0025B5 is Cisco's OUI, and you can override that on the fiber channel pools, but it's really suggested that you don't. Uh, go ahead and leave those. Now, fiber channel networks or fabrics are usually smaller than Ethernet fabric, so it's even less of a chance of having a collision with a name that's already taken, but it's still a good idea. And since you can fill in a lot of the rest of the address, usually you have enough digits to even set up a good naming standard and still have a lot of addresses left over for blades. So there's also two common formats, what we know as NAA2 and NAA5. NAA2 addresses start with 20, and that's what we see in the example above. NAA5 addresses start with 50, 5, 0. These are normally reserved for storage arrays. So what I'll do a lot of times is, when I'm doing zoning, where we sell a lot of EMC storage equipment, so usually we'll be zoning against an EMC storage array and those have five zero starting WWNNs as well as WWPNs. So you can use either one, 20 or 50, but it's usually a good idea for UCS blades to start with 20, NAA2, just as kind of standard nomenclature so that your storage administrators are used to seeing end host start with uh, 20. We want to make sure and keep doing that so there's no confusion on the fabric. These pools are created in the SAN tab under pools, WWNN pools. So some suggested formats here. There's a lot of flexibility in the node name format. You can define almost the entire address, but again, I suggest you leave the OUI alone. Now, here's the thing. You don't use WWNNs a lot. You don't zone against them. Normally, we zone against the port names, not the node names. But it is nice to be able to look up in a fabric at a node name and possibly get some information. So kind of use that to your advantage when you're doing your naming schemes, but it's not something you're going to be working with a lot. My suggestion is, is that whatever you set up for the node name, you use the same naming format for the port name. So that way it's nice and easy. So some examples here, uh, 20 we have to leave. We cannot change 20. And so we can use the second field to denote this as a node name. So you may want to put like 11 here. Or you may want to put 00, zero and I'll give you some examples of why you might want to do that, but something different to denote that it's a node name and not a port name. You could also do domain ID or location ID, and then you can also do things such as OS. So a lot of times we will do this as far as, you know, again, Windows, Linux, VMware, whatever. So WWPNs or port names are unique for a fiber channel port. So a blade with a single mezzanine will have two, at least two WWPNs, one for each port, and one WWNN. Every time you create a virtual HBA, if you have a Palo or VIC-1280 or something like that, and you might slice up four H, uh, virtual HBAs, each one of those virtual HBAs is going to have a port name. So you may have a lot more of these. Uh, these are what you zone against. So when we're zoning storage, you will normally use the port names. Again, they're formatted as 64-bit addresses. 
uh, separated by colons, and again, Cisco's OUI is 0025B5, pretty much the same as a node name. They're also created in pretty much the same place. It's in the SAN tab. You go down to pools and right next to WWNN or WWPN pools. So there's still a lot of flexibility because we can basically change everything that we could on the node name. So since we zone with these, one thing may be to do, say, a fabric ID. So in the first example, I show domain ID. Uh, on this one, you may do fabric ID or some kind of a combination of both. So you could do a domain and a fabric. So if you have five UCS installs, you could do two zero colon one through five. And then, so it'd be two zero colon, you know, three and then you could have a one for fabric A and a two for fabric B, something like that. And that's also why I suggested you pick something unique for the node name that'll be different from the port name format. So just kind of, you know, work up your own format. You can also add in OS ID as well and still have a lot of digits left over for sequential names and sequential addresses. So great deal of flexibility here. So let's jump over to the lab. This will be a fairly quick lab because we're going to do a couple of pools. We're going to create a WWNN pool and then a WWPN pool. And you'll see that, you know, really it's basically the same. It's just we'll do it in two separate places, but you'll give the format and then you'll just, uh, you know, we create a pool, give it a name, give it the format and the size of the pool. So let's go ahead and jump on over to the lab. So once again, we're back in the UCS PE environment, the platform emulator and we will go to the sand tab. We'll go here to pools and we'll start with node name pools. So there is a default, but we'll go ahead and create one. So we'll say this is demo, www, www.nn, just call it pool. Simple as that. So it's gonna say, here's your current blocks of which we have none. So we'll go ahead and add. And here we go. So for example, if I try to change this to a one, it's going to throw me an error. So you have to leave that as to zero. Um, I've actually seen some Cisco documentation that says to change this for some things, especially on port names. And I've never been able to get that to work on any version of UCS. And actually for this class, I confirmed with Cisco that that was a mistake. So if you see anything at least, you know, 2.0 or earlier that says you can change this, you cannot. So we could do 2.0 and then we'll say 1.1 or you could do something that may be outside. So if you're going to use, you know, location and fabric here, we may do something like 9.9 nine. or cluster 1 and do a 9 for, you know, denoting this as a node name, whatever you want to use. 0025B5 is Cisco's OUI. And then we could do something here for OS or anything else that you want. So maybe 1.1 one, one. or you could just do 1.0 and then it'll increment these first five digits. It's kind of up to you. Size, we'll do 512. Good enough. Say OK and finish. Now we can come into our pool that we created here. And here's our block from here to here. So it shows the starting and ending numbers. And if we look at the pool itself, we can get, I'm sorry, initiators. We can go through and see every initiator. So when we create a service profile, and assign the service profile to a blade that has virtual HBAs and we say go use this pool for your, for your WWNNs, then you'll see where it's assigned to. So as we deploy service profiles, these will start to fill in. There's also some things here, boot target WWPN and boot target LUN, that if you do boot from SAN, which is a very good option when you want to use service profiles, it will actually show what your boot target and your boot target LUN is right here for each one of these. So that's good information to quickly be able to check. Do the same thing here with WWPN pools. We'll create one. There's already a default, but we'll go ahead and go ahead and add one. Demo WWPN pool. Next, and we will add a block once again. So we could do something like two zero, and again it won't let me change that. Uh, we could say, okay, this is cluster one fabric B. And you probably would want to change the name of that pool to, den to denote that it's Fabric A or Fabric B. But continuing on, there's the OUI. And then once again, you could do something like, you know, an OS designation here. And then you'd probably want to, again, name it something like Fabric A Windows. So you can have a lot of pools. There's nothing wrong with having Fabric A for Windows, Linux, VMware. Fabric B, Windows, Linux, VMware. So that would be six pools right there. 
There's really nothing wrong with that. When you set up your service profiles, just point it to the right one. That's the great thing about UCS, it is very flexible, so kind of use it as you want to and how it fits your environment. So we'll say OK and finish again. Come back here and we will look at the, the again the blocks and the initiators. So we see all the initiators as well as our boot target or our assignment to our boot target port name and our boot target line. So that's it. It's very simple to create these. You know, the, the thing to keep in mind is to pick a good naming format or a scheme and stick with it and make sure it fits your environment. Don't go crazy where you leave yourself, you know, 16 addresses to assign because that's just not going to be enough. But do it so that it makes sense. And, you know, don't go crazy with it if you don't think you're actually going to use your naming scheme or, you know, you need to know what the OS is going by a port name, things like that. Just make sure it fits your environment. So that's it for the lab. Let's jump back over to the slide deck. So next is server pools. Server pools, as the name suggests, are really just pools of servers or pools of blades. They are used to simplify provisioning. So when you deploy a service profile, you can deploy it to either a physical blade. So I can say, okay, I'm going to deploy a service profile to chassis 4 blade 8 or to a server pool. So I'm going to deploy it to server pool B. If you deploy it to a pool, it grabs a blade from the pool. Well, it assigns a profile to the pool. It really, the blade stays in there, it just has a profile assigned to it. And when you assign a service profile to it, it only chooses a blade that doesn't already have one associated. So basically you'll see a pool of blades. Some will have service profiles possibly associated, some will not. The ones that do not are available to be provisioned. And a blade can exist in multiple pools. So kind of like the little diagram at the bottom, we have A and B, and there's a blade that's a member of both of them, and here we'll talk about why you can do that. Servers are assigned to pools in two different ways, either manually by an administrator, so when you create a pool, or later, you can come in and manually move blades into it, or you can do it automatically via a policy. A pool policy will really say, there's a couple of pieces as we'll see here, but really it just says, look, if a blade meets these criteria, put it in this pool. And a blade may meet the criteria of two or more pools, so it can be in multiple pools. And you do this by creating an empty pool, selecting the qualification criteria, such as it has to be at least four cores and 32 gig of RAM, and then you create a pool policy that associates the two. This will make a lot more sense in the lab when we do it here in a second, but it's really a three-step process. Empty pool, pool qualification, and then a pool policy that goes and looks for blades that meets the qualification and then puts them in the pool. Blades are placed in the pool at time of discovery. So this is the way it used to be. In testing some of the latest UCSM releases, it's no longer the case. So it used to be when you popped a blade into a chassis, it would apply these pool policies then. But if you created one of these policies, it didn't automatically apply to the existing blades. And in my testing, it now does that. So if for some reason yours doesn't, you'll have to do what you call re-acknowledging or reacting the blades. And I'll try and show you that in the lab. But from what I've seen in at least 1.4 and 2.0, it does it automatically. So let's go ahead and jump in the lab and see. So in this lab, we're going to create a server pool. We're going to create the pool policy qualification and then the actual policy that assigns blades to a pool. And then I'll show you how to react an existing blade. So let's go ahead and jump over to UCSPE and take a look. So here we are again, UCSPE, and we're on the Equipment tab. And since we're on this tab, let me go ahead and show you how to re-acknowledge a blade in case you need to do that. So you come in, uh, you do chassis, pick your chassis, and then pick your server or your blade. You do it via the server maintenance option. So you click that, and then it's re-acknowledge right there. We say OK, and it's going to cause a reboot. And it's going to say, you sure you want to reboot? Yeah, sure. We're in a platform emulator. Why not? So we'll go ahead and kick that off. If it was production, you probably don't want to do that. And so it's going to go through it again. If you notice here real quick, it's in a discovery process. So as I just said in the slide deck, when it goes through discovery, it'll apply the policy. So if for some reason it did not apply to your existing blades, you can go through and react those. Now, if a blade already has a service profile on it, you probably don't need to put it in a pool. I mean, maybe if you're, for some reason, provisioning and unprovisioning blades, you want to do that. 
But if you've got blades that don't have service profiles assigned to them and you re-acknowledge them, eh, reboot's not a big deal. So just kind of do this depending on if you need it, but make sure you need it first. So now let's go do our server pools. So we go to the servers tab, pools, and server pools. So the first thing we need to do is create an empty pool. So we'll say OK. And we'll give it a demo server pool. Oops. Can't type. Say OK, or Next. And here we can manually assign servers. So we could say move that guy over there, or take him back out. And when you click these, you'll notice down at the bottom, it gives you some information such as model number, serial number, and vendor. But since we want this to be blank, let's leave it blank and hit Finish. OK, so we now have our demo pool. Next is our qualifications. So there's already one here for all chassis which just says all chassis. So any blade is going to go into this pool. Uh, or if we create a policy to do it, it would apply to pretty much any blade in any chassis. That's boring, so let's do something more fun. So we'll pick server pool policy qualifications. We'll hit our little plus sign, and we'll give it a name. Demo pool qual. And then here on the left, you can pick all sorts of different things. So you can say chassis numbers. You know, if you want to do specific chassis, you can do CPU and core, so we can say which processor architecture. What I find funny is there's AMDs and, and dual core Opterons and Pentium Force, things that you can't get. Uh, blades or even rack mounts for UCS are here. So I don't know what they're trying to tell us there, but really just do any because you're going to have the same Intel kind of family anyway. You can do regular expressions if you want to get really crazy. But let's just do cores because that's simple. So we'll say a minimum of four cores, which is going to apply to all of our blades here. But you could do 16 cores. If you had the new B230s, you could say 20 cores. Just whatever you want to do. But for this example, I'll do four. And then you can also say memory. So it has to have four cores and a minimum capacity of 16,000. So it's going to be a little less than 16 gig. So notice it's in megabytes. So we'll say OK. You can also set things like speed and stepping. You can do storage, depending on if they have you know, uh, local storage or if they're diskless. You can even say that. Uh, power, rack, uh, just simple slot number information. Um, chassis, we did that. Adapters, what type of adapter do they have? FCOE. Uh, encapsulation, non-virtualized, so really you can do all sorts of things with it. But let's just stick with our simple and boring quad-core and 16 gig of RAM. So we'll say OK. And now we've created that. Next is we create a server pool policy. So we created a pool to place servers in. We told it what we want our criteria to be. And this is the glue. This will take a look at the criteria apply it to the blades, and then take those blades and put it in the pool. So we'll say add server pool. And you'll see a lot of people do things like POL to define a policy as an object, so end it with POL. What's our target pool? So if we click that, oops, actually we want to click the drop-down box. If we click the drop-down box, we can pick which one we want. So we want our demo server pool. And then for qualification, we want to do our demo pool qualification, and we hit OK. So there you go. Target pool, target qualification. Now if we come down to our pool and look at servers, it's starting to add some. So it started to add server 1, 2, chassis 1, slot 2, dynamically added. So if we take a look at that guy, We can look at inventory, CPUs, that's a little weird. I think that's a PE bug, so we'll just discard that. So server 1, 2, let's go back to equipment, chassis 1, server 2 is unassociated, and he is 12 cores and 64 gig of RAM, so he meets our qualifications. He is 10 cores and 8 gig of RAM. So that's why he didn't get chosen. So it needed to be 16. It chose 2 and not 1. 
I never realized those were different, but that makes for an absolutely great example, doesn't it? So you can see right there how that is useful. And then you've got the rack server, which uh, we never really talk about here, but is a server down here who has eight cores and 24 gig of RAM, so he meets the criteria. So you can see that you can kind of set these things up. Think of it like rules. If you have this and this and this, I'm going to put you in one pool. If you have this and this, I may put you in another. And again, a server can exist in more than one pool at one time. Also remember, it's a three-step process. A pool, a set of criteria, and then the policy that binds them together. So that's it for the lab. Let's jump back to the slide deck. So that is it for the pools lesson. Uh, hopefully that was good. Hopefully you learned a lot, got your wheels turning a little bit on how you want to do some of your naming schemes and things like that. But we started with what are pools. We talked about you know how we use service profiles, why we don't want to use the hard-coded information on a blade, and why we want to kind of create our own address and other assignments. That way we have this portability that's given to us by service profiles. Then we went through the types of pools. There are identity pools, which are like management IP address, UUID, MAC, WWNN, WWPN, and then there's resource pools like server pools and their membership criteria. So the management IP address pool, again, was your KVM IPs. You can assign those to a service profile or to a physical blade uh, statically or via pool. We showed you how to do a pool, and you have to remember those have to be on the management zero network because there's no VLAN configuration. Then we talked about the universally unique identifier, which is like your serial number. Very simple, really the only suggestion there is maybe put a domain ID in the address. MAC address pools, we kind of went in and talked about that. That was our first one. We really started talking about naming schemes. So you may want to do domain, you may want to do a cluster or location. It's possible to do a fabric A or fabric B, and or you can do your operating system. That applies as WWNNs, node names, and WWPN port names for the fiber channel world as well. You have a lot of capability to kind of you know craft your naming standard however you want it. And then finally server pools. So we can take blades, put them in pools, and then when we assign service profiles in a little bit, you'll be able to just grab those out of those pools and go ahead and make it easy instead of just pointing at a blade. We just set that criteria up that kind of presets them in a pool. So the membership was a three-step process. You create a blank pool, you create your criteria, your qualification criteria, and then you create the actual policy which scans the blades and puts them in the right pool. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense and it's really going to solidify things for service profiles. So once again, thank you for listening to the lesson. Hope to see you again on the next one.